idea here. Uh, so I will start with uh, the motivations of our work. Like, so I'll, um, I'll talk about a little bit, just like uh, the Portuguese empire background in the early modern period. Um, then I'll talk about the archi archival data. So the particularities that we have from this data and what was so complicated and so, and it's a complex data. And I think you have an idea of uh, why we call this a journey because yeah, it's, it's, it's really complex. Um, then I'll talk about our methodology. We call this like the six steps that we took. Of course, were many more micro steps, but we like to point out this uh, six that were kind of like a game changer for, for, for our work. Then I'll talk about the results from give some statistics of this data set and I'll talk about the networks and open for like future work. And after talking about the future work, of course, um, yeah, taking questions and would be very nice if you could brainstorm with the participants. So I'm hoping that I'm going to spend uh, 20 to 30 minutes here. So we have plenty of time to, to talk after the presentation. Okay, so I start with the motivations. Uh, so in the last decades in the uh, Portuguese and Brazilian historiography, uh, there's uh, uh, there's this debate about how centralized was the Portuguese empire. And there's this the kind of new theory of multi-continental monarchy, which is different from the composite monarchy, because the, in this multi-continental monarchy, the idea is that um, instead of looking at the Portuguese empire, having all the decisions coming from the metropole, like from the king, actually the, the colonies ha had a really important uh, role in shaping the policy of the of the empire uh, so 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 kind of like i was uh, um, a joint uh, joint joint decisions were being made by like the the authorities and the king uh, in portugal but also the uh, the local authorities in the, in the communities so we thought that with this data set of like communication we could contribute to to this debate and and this, this debate leads to something that's really interesting about the independence of the Brazil, because the Brazilian independence, it's quite unique among the, um, the, the American countries, right? So if you compare how it was done in, in the beginning of the 19th century, uh, starting with the American uh, independence, uh, there were there were like a lot of bloodshed, like uh, wars and like uh, violent uh, revolts and so on. While in Brazil, yes, there there were a, a couple of revolts, but they were not as close as what we saw um, in the whole continent. The other thing that's unique is the ter territorial unity. Like so, Brazil, the the, the, ter the territory of Brazil, it's pretty much the same now as it was before the independence. So. Uh, unlike the Spanish uh, America that uh, was fragmented in many, many countries, Brazil kept this whole unit and kept like being one of the largest countries in the world. And the third thing is that the continuation of the system of government. So in America, uh, pretty much every country became a republic, but in Brazil, we, for, from 1822 to 1889, we were still an empire or a, mon uh, a monarchy. So this is quite unique in the American continent as well. And there are several um, um, reasons that the historians debate about this, like what, 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 what drove like the, the independence of Brazil, like being so unique like that. Uh, and they tend to agree that it was because of this powerful elite that was established in Brazil. So we want to look at uh, those communications as well with this perspective of how, what was the role of the elites or if actually the ordinary oppressed people uh, by sending letters or sending petitions to, to the authorities, they also play a role in what we can call the bottom up history of Brazil. So for that, we have our archi archival data and uh, this data is stored by the Historical Overseas Archives in Lisbon. And it's the official correspondence between Portugal and the Atlantic colonies. So we don't have like correspondence in correspondence um, 
we think Portugal only, uh, and we and, and we don't have that in uh, in this in this data, like the communications that the the, the letters that uh, were exchanged only in Portugal. So we have like the letters that were uh, exchanged between the colony and the metropole, but also within the colonies, but with matters that relate to the sovereignty of the empire. And the letters that we have here is from 1610 uh, uh, to 1833, but our analysis focuses on 1642 to 1822, and 1642 is when the um, uh, the Overseas Council was established in 1822 is um, the Brazilian independence. And th this, the, the, the whole thing, uh, in a, the whole data set, uh, in the whole data set, we have 169,221 uh, documents. And the letters, like the originals are like this thing. Um, and they are long and they are more um, uh, complete in a sense in their content. But this is not our, our source of this work. Right? The source of this work is something more like this uh, summary that was made by a massive work uh, by archivists in several areas in Brazil, Portugal, and the other African colonies, that they, they, they catalog this, uh, this original document, these original letters. Uh, but when they did it, they didn't use a structured way of uh, cataloging this in the sense of like re related to the content. They just classify chronologically and uh, geographically like the letters, but the content, there's no structure of so whatsoever. So no XML or things like this. Uh, unfortunately, it, it's just like we just had access or we just have access uh, if you go to the uh, overseas archives of Lisbon website, to to a plain text, right? So that was that was a really challenge. Like, how can we take like plain text of almost one hundred seven thousand documents and do something meaningful with the like extracting the, the information? Right? So what we start doing is that uh, first in this process. We took all these these uh, these registers uh, in separate files, and we create a random sample of the separate files. Uh, and the size of this random sample is 2.5 percent of the whole uh, corpus, so about 4,000 documents. And we 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 randomly chose these 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 files, and we create a JSON file in that every line. In, uh, is, is the content of that register that we extract from the PDF files, right? So we have then this file with 4,000 lines and each line corresponds to a different register. And this, this, um, uh, this file was used as a, the input for the annotation that we use the Prodigy, the Prodigy uh, software for annotating documents. And the annotation is pretty much like this. So this 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 figure here is an extract of the inner part of um, of the Prodigy software. So in um, in the header here, we have all the categories that we can that we can that we we define. So we define eight categories uh, beforehand, and this was something that evolved as well. We, we, we tried to create a, a name entity recognition model um, with different ways. And then we, we didn't have like a satisfactory results and so on. So th this was something that was evolving until we reach, we reached this, uh, this eight categories. And, and we, 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 we start annotating the documents with Prodigy uh, using these categories, right? So we can just like um, uh, highlight the, the 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 words and click uh, each category, and then we have this annotation. And then the eight categories that we look at at this moment, and perhaps later on we will see that we need even more, and then we have to do this work again, perhaps is male and female names, civil, religious, and military organizations, the title of these actors, their occupation, and the local 
so we can see where the sender was when uh, they sent the letters. Okay, um, so after annotating, and I must say the annotating is the most uh, time consuming part of everything here, I guess. The, it's the manual uh, part of the whole thing. So we, we created a name entity recognition model from scratch uh, using uh, Spessi. And we, we can, we can uh, choose if you want to use like a pre-training model or from scratch, but because we have different categories, so much of like this uh, personalized um, um, way of uh, thinking about this corpus, we decided to train from scratch. So we didn't use any pre-trained model because also because it, uh, we, we realized that the pre-trained models, they were not providing satisfactory results because first they don't have the categories, all those categories pre-trained. And we thought that uh, we need those for the work that we're doing now. And the, the, the locations, the name of the locations changed a lot and they, they changed from village to city and so on. So it was really complicated. And then we thought that uh, it was just much better if you train the model from scratch. Uh, okay. And what we did is like from that uh, almost a uh, little over 4,000 um, uh, register that we randomly sampled, we took 8% uh, of the annotated sample to train, actually train the model and then we took 20% for testing and see how good the model was. And we achieved like, based on this 20% of testing, we achieved 93% of accuracy, which is great. But of course, we know that we have to improve even more, uh, especially because when we talk about history, like the, the, the macro, it's important. But when we, we go to the uh, micro, then uh, a higher accuracy make, can make a lot of difference. And when you talk about 172,000 documents, so you can imagine like even if 7% of name uh, entities are not well uh, recognized, then we have we still a lot of uh, to, to improve here. But, but even though for name entity recognition, 92% is very, very good. Okay, and then what we had, like, because we had this plain uh, text, we, 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 kind of like we're looking how we would identify the senders, the recipients, the content, how, how we could do that. Like in, in reading many of those, we realized that uh, at least the archivists, they, have, they, they had some patterns that they follow when transcribing this, this original documents. Right? So we could divide the, the register in three parts. The first part would start when we, we could uh, um, identify things in Portuguese that corresponds to from or from the, that that, that part contains the, the sender metadata. Uh, the second part would, would then be when we have this uh, to or to the, that contains the recipient's metadata. So someone, uh, so, so for example, here we have, uh, the petition uh, from uh, Dona Francisca Joseph de Souza, blah, 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 and so on, to the king, uh, Don Juan V. Yeah. And the third part starts with the ING verb, right? So in Portuguese, it's pretty much NDO, it means like uh, asking, petitioning, uh, demanding, and so on. So we, we, we split the, the register in three parts following these patterns uh, that um, archivists use. But because this massive work uh, was done uh, by different groups and different times and so on, they don't uh, follow always this pattern. Some, sometimes we still have to, to make some corrections in, in this thing as, as well. Um, so it was challenging, but at least uh, the vast majority of the, um, of the register at least followed these patterns. 
And then the, the fifth step was the um, metadata extraction. So then after we split those, those raster in three, and we had this name entity recognition model, we could extract some metadata, metadata from, 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 the, from the resters. And we extract for now document ID, document type, the date, the sending local, uh, and the, the, the metadata of the senders and the recipients, name, title, and gender. And the gender, of course, is because of how we categorize the, the, name, ent uh, the name entity recognition model. And finally, when we were constructing, constructing, constructing the networks, we realized that um, we had a lot of duplicates because of typos or just because um, they couldn't they couldn't like uh, infer from the original the right names and so on. So so we, we we had a lot of duplicates. And then what we did is that we use an algorithm that compared like this uh, sequence of characters, so it compares the strings. And what we did is that we we. First, we took the, the version of the name that was more frequent, and then we used that version as reference uh, because uh, we had so many names, we could just not look at all the all names like historical. Some, some of course, we know because they are like prominent uh, figures and so on, but most of them, it's, it's, they are like anonymous people. Uh, just to give an idea, we were talking about uh, in the whole corpus, um, we identify about 40,000 or a little over 40,000 um, senders and about 9,000 recipients. So it's just, it would be just impossible to, to check their names. So what we did is again, we took like the, the name that was most frequent in the whole corpus and then we compare with like those variants and then we correct like that. For example, Fernando José de Portugal, we change actually to Fernando José de Portugal. Or we saw like typos like this, uh, Gomes Freire de Andrade, and then we, we change to Gomes Freire de Andrade. And, and this, this thing, like, as I said, like uh, some, some actors that we know, we didn't use this in, in, in this um, algorithm, especially the monarchs, because then, for example, Don Juan the fourth would would quickly be Don Juan the fifth or Don Juan the sixth, depending on the the frequency or how we 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 create this algorithm, right? And then with those things, after after we then uh, Avoid this. Avoided this uh, duplication of nodes. We created our networks, and those, our networks are directed. So sender pointing to the recipient and weighted based on the number of letters that a sender sent to our recipient. And just to to summarize all this methodology, so we we with the original letters. Then from the archive transcriptions uh, uh, from the archivists, we, we, we took this, uh, the summary of the, the catalogs. We create the random sampling for te text annotation. We use expressions for seeing the patterns that the archivists used. And then we put both together to extract the metadata, to extract like the, the names and so on of the name entity and recognition to create this network data and then during the network construction, we avoided duplicates and then we create those networks. And just to give you some statistics so you can familiarize yourselves uh, better before we jump to the networks. Uh, so this, this is the, the, the evolution of the number of uh, letters exchanged. And we can see like some jumps here. It's really interesting. Like, so this first jump, it's like when the Portuguese empire of uh, uh, shift their focus, so they 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 were pretty much concerned about the India uh, colony, uh, and then in the beginning of the 18th century they start to change, and then they give gave more attention to to the uh, Atlantic colonies, 
And the other thing that uh, that spikes here is uh, the period that precedes the uh, precedes Napoleon's invasion. Uh, so it's about like ten years before that. Um, we have this high activity of uh, uh, letters. Then we want to now investigate what what the, those letters were talking about, or like, or they're preparing already uh, the the royal court to to flee to Brazil and changing the Portuguese uh, empire capital from Lisbon to Rio de Janeiro. So that's something that we want to investigate because this coincides like with 10 years before the change of the capital, before this, the, the, the royal court flee to, to Brazil and during the Napoleon Wars. The statistic is, is like the, the number of documents per type. So we see that like most of the documents are petitions. So people asking things from uh, the colonies to the local authorities or directly to the authorities in the metropole. And the petition was pretty much the letters that were like, um, the citizens were asking for things. And the circular and somewhat the letters were those that uh, were kind of the response to these petitions. So the monarch or the authorities would issue the circulars or these letters uh, kind of in a response to the petitions or to uh, introduce new policy and so on. So, so the, those two are, or those three, let's say, are the most important, the most um, um, frequent in our corpus. And they pretty much follow that pattern that we're talking about from someone to someone else and asking for something, demanding something, or ordering something and so on. And we see again, like the, the spike of those two um, in that period preceding uh, uh, the change of the capital in the Portuguese empire. And here another graph just to give an idea of like how complex this, this data set is. So here we have like uh, um, the frequency of the occupations of senders that we found. So we have to, in this histogram, we have to try Trunc truncate uh, in the top 100 occupations that we identified because this would just go on and on, right? So when you're talking about like the types of the documents, we have about 500 different types of documents and then occupations, we have uh, thousands of occupations, but then we truncated here in the top 100 occupations of the senders and the recipient occupations it's not so homogeneous, so you can see that uh, even because the number of recipients are uh, it's much smaller than the number of uh, senders, but also because the recipients are pretty much those in the authorities, so those in government or those in uh, the elite and so on. So it's not so homogeneous as the sender occupations. And the same is for the affiliations, like for the organization that they were part of. Right? So again, it's, it's really complex. So we have thousands of organizations and again, we have to truncate it here uh, in the top 100 affiliations of the senders and recipients that appeared. And we see this like uh, for the senders, we have this homogeneous, more homogeneous distribution while for the recipient, it's still, but not as much. Um, and of course those, those uh, here are, um, most like the governors or judges or secretaries and so on. And this, this dashed line here, it's like just marking the top 10 that in the paper, we have a table with the top 10 uh, occupations for senders, for recipients, affiliation, uh, and affiliations for sender recipients, so, so, and so on. So this just give, I think this actually gives a pretty good idea of the, how, how complicated it is to work with this data set and how complex is like the, the structure of the Portuguese empire and the communication that, uh, the, the, how complex is the, this communication channels in the Portuguese empire in the early modern period. But then jumping for networks, uh, so as time goes by and like monarchs change, we see like a, a jump in the size and it's again like this jump happens because of that shift 
uh, of focus of the Portuguese empire uh, through the, the Atlantic colonies. But what's pretty interesting here is to see that the average degree didn't change much. So more and more people now are exchanging communication, but again, we have this heavily uh, high skewed distribution, like heavily tailed distribution um, of, of like people. So we have many, many people just send one letter or two and just a few people receiving or sending many of them. So this works for both sending and uh, receiving um, the, these documents. And so we have this, the first, the first uh, network that we create here during the reign of uh, Juan IV. So the network is fairly, still fairly small. And the, we see, of course, the, the, the monarch in the center. So he received a lot of uh, this, these letters. Um, the red nodes is actually the ego network of the monarch. So we can see like who actually directly communicated with the monarch. And we, we see then, of course, that we have this bunch of people directly communicated with uh, the king. And the network grows as the number of uh, documents uh, grows, uh, more activity. So we can see that um, uh, we have like this growing number uh, or like the, the growing neighborhood of uh, the ego network of the king or the queen uh, until the reign of Joseph uh, the first. So here uh, in the reign of uh, Jean the fifth, we already have like this bunch uh, of nodes, like uh, 80,000 nodes and we see like this massive uh, ego network. So people sending letters straight to the king. But then uh, when, when, the, um, when the, new, the new monarch comes, uh, Jose the first, uh, then we can, we can see this uh, change in the structure. And this change that we are visualizing here, it's also seeing the degree distributions that we have in the paper. Uh, and it's pretty nice to see this change. And at the same time that uh, we can think of, okay, now we have more actors sharing the stage with the monarch and we can see that the ego network of the monarch has actually decreased. But it's quite interesting because uh, during the reign of uh, Jose the first, we have, we have the figure of uh, Marquês de Pombal, who I was known to be uh, to like centralized, uh, uh, to like uh, to 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 advocate a centralized government, but the structure of the the network really changed. The, the structure of the communication network really changed, and that's something that we have to investigate. Why why this 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 figure known uh, as being like uh, as advocating for uh, advocating the centralized government. But during the, 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 the government of his monarch or his king, we have these other figures appearing and sharing the stage. Right? While Juan V um, was known as not so much uh, like, uh, of a centralized government, but then all the, 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 the documents, not all of course, but like a majority of documents was like directly sent to him. Then we have again like the uh, a, a difference, a change in the structure of the communication network with the reign of Maria the first, and here we we see like this this node here aggregating many things, and this can be misleading because actually Maria was a mad woman, so this is kind of uh, complicated, and this node actually is. Uh, her son, the priest, the prince regent's son, that became the king later on, uh, Juan the Sixth. So, so they kind of share the stage, and like we have like this massive ego network of uh, the prince, and we actually don't know if uh, well because we are talking about a queen, and then it's the first time that we see a woman in uh, in the position of the monarch 
or if because she was actually considered mad and then people didn't trust her so much is something that uh, we have to investigate in the structure. But we also see, uh, apart from this, we see like a densification of uh, 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 letters exchange among other actors. So if you go back, we, we, we see that, okay, we had a, a already a densification happening here, but nothing like this, right? So, so a lot of other people are, are now changing, uh, exchanging communication. And again, we are not sure why we have to investigate this thing. And then the network for Juan the Six, it's not so, so big, but we see again, uh, the concentration increasing, the ego network, the ego network increasing, but again, it's just like a small period of like six years, about six years. So it, it's it's hard to tell much what would be the government uh, if Brazil hadn't got its independence, its independence. Okay, so for future work now, uh, what we are thinking is okay. Letters are just one channel. Letters. Um, it's, it's, we cannot rely completely on that because of course we all know that uh, it's hard to have uh, an idea of how complete the, the corpus actually is. We have no idea about this. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge for every historical study. Um, but it's just one way of inferring ties. So we go back here to, to the, the reign of Maria the First we see, for example, that there's no communication between uh, Maria and her son in terms of letters. But of course they talk about something, of course they had uh, some kind of uh, interaction, but this cannot be captured in the letters. So we want to look for other sources to uh, expand this data set and have a better idea of uh, the, the, the networks of the early modern Portuguese empire. And want to do so by focusing on the organization. So we, we are hoping that we can investigate other archives to look at the organizations and see how people are belonging to these organizations. And we expect to do that with two mode networks. Then we also want to apply topic modeling. So we want to look at this uh, exchange and communication uh, divided by different topics. So they were discussing economic, political, administrative, religious matter whatsoever. Uh, so, so we have this multiplex networks and then we can kind of have an idea which kind of people were discussing more, what, which kind of matter. And finally, we want to aggregate nodes. Uh, so we see that individually, they are not so representative, but when we aggregate, and that's something that we did uh, for the governors, for example, uh, they, they have a much uh, more relevant role when we aggregate as groups. Uh, so you want to look at, at, at those networks in, from the perspective of like a posopographical analysis as well. So the network would be something like this, it's just like a, a diagram like sketch a sketch of like what we think of the network. So like the relationships are gonna be uh, um, depending on the, the type of uh, matter was discussed. And then we would have this affiliation relationships as well if we manage to put all those sources that we want to together. And that's it uh, for now. And um, yeah, open for questions and discussions. Thanks, thanks a lot.